In episode number 307 of the Reasons I'm Broke podcast, we cover the second Venom trailer. We also have what's new on Netflix for this month. And our comic book highlight this week is Justice League Dark number one. We're also bringing you a full interview with Bernie Gonzalez from Alternate Comics' Midnight Mystery Number 1. All of this and so much more on today's show. Hello and welcome to the Reasons I'm Broke podcast, bringing you the reasons we're broke every week, ranging from comics, movies, TV, video games, and so much more. I am the Almighty Emperor Palpa Kelly. And I am Darth Vader Daniel. And for those of you joining us for the very first time, welcome to the show. The way we format the show is first we're going to start out with some news. We have our Brokehead block, our Patreon shoutouts, and finally our comic book highlight and our interview at the end. You heard us review it last week with Teen Titans Go to the Movies. Well, we found out exactly how well it performed at the box office with a budget of just $10 million. It has raked in $11.5 million worldwide in spite of it only opening in eight foreign markets. But it's not as good as the original. <laughs> <laughs> It's that the thing that uh, we learned in when we were taking some film classes is that whenever a movie does break even at the box office during that opening weekend, that's when it is considered uh, successful because then in the uh, following weeks, while it doesn't make as much as that first opening weekend, that tends to be the pure profit from there to help pay for some of the marketing as well. And then after that, you have the Blu-rays, the streaming deals and everything else. And it will make more money as of this weekend when this podcast releases. It will be opening in the United Kingdom, Hong Kong, and Saudi Arabia. This movie was great. We really enjoyed it. We talked about it last week, like we said. I am so happy that it's making money because our theater was (laughs) empty. (laughs) But apparently people went to see it, and it was really funny. (laughs) Yeah, I chalked that up to us going at night. It was on a Thursday night, and I know it's like the summer and kids, but... A lot of younger kids are the ones that went to see Teen Titans Go, so they actually probably went the next day Mm -hmm. on Friday morning with their parents and uh, not getting out of the movie at, you know, 9 or 10 at night, which is right about their bedtime. I hope I hope our child goes to bed earlier than 9 or 10 at night. <laughs> but this was a really cute movie. If you guys haven't seen it, if you have young ones, even if you don't, we enjoyed it. We didn't take Leo to see it. We said, you stay home, Leo. <laughs> We're going to go to the movies. We talk about the Marvel sheep on the podcast pretty <laughs> often now. And it seems like professional grade Marvel sheep have come out in support of James Gunn after his firing. Do professional grade Marvel sheep wear like suits with, <laughs> with like little Marvel logos all over them? You know how, have you ever seen the t-shirts that are I Heart ZS, which is for I Heart Zack Snyder? No, but that's cool. Uh, one of the cyborg actually wore one at San Diego Comic Con last year, I believe. Mm-hmm. And then the fans have kind of made it their own and campaigned and, and a lot of them changed their Twitter logo to that picture of I Heart ZS. The professional grade Marvel Sheep have the <laughs> I Heart JG. That's what they would be wearing. Oh, my God. How? I don't understand. <laughs> oh, my head. It hurts. So several Guardians of the Galaxy crew members and actors have come out in full support for the director to get reinstated. And with the, the huge signing, the huge plaque that they kind of sort of put out on the internet it's basically a huge block of text and then they all are artificially signed it at the bottom saying that they're in support of james gunn and how people do change over time and that he should get reinstated well some have read this as like if he if james gunn doesn't come back then none of us are going to come back and no the cast is unlikely to leave guardians of the galaxy 3 due to the legal ramifications of breaking a contract of already being signed on to number three james gunn ain't nobody's best friend enough that they're gonna (laughs) break their contract (laughs) exactly (laughs) several unnamed sources at variety are saying that it's unlikely that disney reinstates gunn and will wait until they find a replacement duh (laughs) this is not news I found a couple of really good comments on Newsarama. Normally, that's where we find like the nerd rage reactions. But in this case, Tom C. on Newsarama said, quote, Yeah, this seems like a non-story. For this to happen, the chairman of Disney Studios would have to walk back his statement. 
Whether he was right or wrong in the statement is irrelevant. It would make him look foolish, and the people inciting this on the other side would make sure everyone and their brother heard about it, end quote. Hell yeah, and that's exactly, that's that's never going to happen. They're just like with House of Cards when they fired Kevin Spacey. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm wondering why people didn't sign a petition for him because <laughs> really a lot more of us like House of Cards than we like Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> but, That's true. A lot of us. <laughs> yes, us, us. But exactly. Disney would have to say, oh, yeah, you know what? We were wrong. Never mind. It's okay to have potential kid touchers working for Those us. Those pedophile tweets. Yeah, man, they, maybe they do align with hey, Disney. I mean, he, like, he must have he changed. <laughs> People are hilarious. Also, Robert H. on Newsarama said, quote, If they reinstate him, it would open up a whole can of worms because then people would be asking, why not reinstate Roseanne and John Lasseter as well? That's not a position Disney wants to be in. End quote. People would ask that, but not the Marvel sheep. No, not at all. No, Absolutely they, well, not. Well, what she said was just too far. It was just <laughs> too much. He's, he's changed. She was just recent. Huh. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't see him getting reinstated and one of the things that people have been bringing up is that once Disney finds its replacement director for Guardians 3, if they choose to move forward with Guardians 3, which they probably will, mm-hmm. uh, that's when they will then announce like for sure, okay, this is the new director. We just so you guys know, we definitely don't plan on having James Gunn come back and instead it will be taken over by this particular person who's also worked on all of this. And by then people will have forgotten all about Guardians 3. You know who I want the new director to be? Who would you have? Snyder. (laughs) Oh, my God. That'd be incredible. (laughs) Holy shit. That'd be uh, Marvel really giving the the middle finger to Warner Brothers. Holy shit. (laughs) Have Zack Snyder up in there, and and then I'd be there for sure to watch it. (laughs) But I want there to be a million Batman references in the backgrounds, and he's just like, no, this is is Catman. I don't know. He just pulls up some bullshit. (laughs) That'd be be great. great. It'd be amazing. And then the Marvel sheep would be like... "Mm." Yeah, you know, people can change. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, Zack Snyder can change, but it's so crazy. The fucking hypocrisy on this. Something that's not made by Disney and not made by Marvel Studios is Sony coming up with the second trailer to Venom. Their uh, offshoot type of villain solo <laughs> movie, not connected with the MCU in that way. I, that's still not really that clear, but you don't see Spider-Man in the movie at all, and it seems like this is kind of its own standalone, mm-hmm. out of continuity from the uh, Marvel Studios films. And I, they have like the in association with Marvel, so it's kind of like it doesn't have that Marvel Studios logo anywhere. And uh, this trailer revealed even more that it, this is a movie about symbiotes. It is a movie about these other aliens and other characters, and not about Spidey. For those of you who are fairly new to the podcast, we were 0% interested in this movie. Until what happened, Daniel? Until they fucking cast Tom Hardy. Fucking Tom Hardy. And let me tell you, I watched this trailer and I only cared about Tom Hardy. (laughs) (laughs) I know you weren't nuts about that first trailer, right? I wasn't really. And I'm still not nuts about this one. When he's all like, I'm going to bite off your legs and your arms and you'll be like a turd in the street. I'm like, (laughs) fuck you, Venom. Nobody cares. (laughs) And then Tom Hardy shows up and he's like, oh, sorry. And I'm like, yeah, Tom Hardy. <laughs> Someone pointed out another character that Tom Hardy plays that is hard to understand. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. It looks okay. It did what this trailer was supposed to do for Venom fans. You got to see Venom. You got to hear him being like, bleh, bleh, bleh. then you got to see the bad guys. And ugh. it's not for me. I don't think this movie is for me. But we're going to go see but, it yes, because of Tom we, Hardy. We will go see it because of Tom Hardy. And we will enjoy Tom Hardy's portions of it. (laughs) And people who are Venom fans, I think that they will enjoy it as well. Because, again, it's giving them what they want to see. I know right now they're worried that the movie is not going to deliver on much of Venom. They're they're afraid it's going to have the Spider-Man 3 syndrome thing where... They didn't show him enough, and that's what a lot of fans were saying about the third Spider-Man. They show him a whole lot in this trailer. Definitely in the trailer. They they just don't want to be fooled by the trailer, and turns out that most of the movie, it's Eddie Brock, like, kind of just using his arms as, as like, the transformation, not the full body. I would prefer that, but whatever they want. (laughs) Me too. Yeah, no, I think it's going to deliver on... I mean, there's several symbiotes, Mm -hmm. symbiotes, that are popping off. I got to correct myself, because that first trailer officially said it, symbiote. And they have all the (laughs) villains running around, They've got several symbiotes in the the trailer where one of them is is going up the other guy's asshole. So it's confirmed, <laughs> yeah. right? Like that's how the symbiotes like get into up the human. So is, is that what uh, 
the cabin in the woods or whatever it was. Which cabin in the woods? Remember that scary movie and the darkness goes up her asshole? No, I don't, I don't remember that. We went and saw it. Yeah, and she had the spooky face that I still see in my dreams. Uh-uh. Oh, uh, Evil you Dead. Remember that? Yeah, oh, Evil Dead, yeah yes. that one, whatever. And it goes up her asshole. It goes up something else, but we're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then this one, it is all about him. You see him use his powers that you see in the comics and the mm-hmm. video games where he blocks bullets by using the, the Venom shield or whatever the hell that is. <laughs> okay. Uh, he doesn't have the big symbol, I noticed, on the chest. Mm-hmm. Instead, it's like white veins throughout the whole costume That's cool. and he doesn't have the squares from the comics either where he actually doesn't even swing from what i saw at all in the trailer he there's no spider-man swinging no venom swinging well if he hasn't movie. met spider-man yet he's not going to be doing those things yeah, well, yeah, but that, I mean, that's what another thing that the fans were saying. It's like you can't have Venom without that story and that origin story of Peter Parker. But if they're making their own anyway, this is an origin story for Eddie without Peter Parker. He right. comes across his government building, I'm assuming, or or private business, and then he the probably the Venom symbiote breaks out and he gets on him, goes up his asshole as we know, and then he breaks <laughs> out and he has to use the alien to kind of defend himself mm-hmm. and kind of deal with. Himself well, being this this super, you know, pseudo superhero. Yeah, it seems like what's going to happen is the symbiote's symbiote is just kind of jumping in, stopping people kind of for self-preservation, right? Because, of course, if his host dies, like, right. he's fucked, he's got to find something else. And then throughout the story, it seems like the two are going to come to a mutual understanding mm-hmm. and kind of work together for something. Yeah, the in the comics, the Venom has to feed. It feeds on brains. Like, yeah. physically, it feeds Yum. on people. So what Eddie Brock says, it's like, all right, we'll do this to criminals, though. Well, we won't do this to innocents, which, which Venom doesn't care. He'll just eat whoever, right? He's just like brains. Cool. Yeah. And then there was actually an older comic that Scotty Young did and drew. And in that one, the Venom gets on Wolverine and it doesn't have to feed anymore because Wolverine's constantly regenerating. Mm-hmm. So it just feeds on its host forever. And, and it kind of looks like a Venomized Wolverine type of thing. Like, it's still Venom, but he has the giant, like the headgear yeah, thing like okay. it's just shaped in black mm-hmm. and then he has claws that are venomized as well so it's it, it's kind of silly but like i thought that was interesting that he could always he found a host that he can never need to starve on anymore and that's when venom used to lose his shit a lot is whenever the venom was hungry mm-hmm. and he didn't want to feed or kill anyone eventually the that'd be like where they came at an impasse where who takes control of who and then eddie brock sometimes would wake up and find that there's all kinds of dead oh, people around them fuck. so that, I think they're going to explore some of that in this, mm-hmm. and it does look like they go after criminals, and that's how Venom kills them, right? It, it does seem like Venom's killing these people. Oh, definitely. I, I think we're going to see a pretty, I say a tough movie, where <laughs> we're all desensitized <laughs> to people eating brains now. But it looks interesting. It looks like they're giving Eddie Brock a story, which, again, is what we wanted to see, mm-hmm. that he's not just, what was he, a jock? What What was Eddie Brock? In the comics? Uh, a photographer, okay. a reporter. Oh, uh, yeah. He was a skinny guy Peter. from the other Spider-Man. <laughs> from Spider-Man 3, yeah. With the, with the hair. Oh, man. No. Didn't like that guy. <laughs> 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 it seems like it's going to be interesting. Venom fans, I'm sure, are enjoying what they're seeing so far. So we'll wait. We're definitely going to see it. And we'll tell you our thoughts when we do. Over to the animated and live action DC side of things. DC Entertainment has announced that an original animated movie based on the Constantine television show will be coming to Blu-ray on October 9th, just in time for Halloween. Ah! (laughs) Is that a good thing or a bad thing? (laughs) Is that a bad ah? (laughs) I'm so excited. Is is Matt Ryan playing Constantine? Yeah, he's voicing Constantine. Ah! Can they pick up where the TV show left off? I think they just ignored that because they're doing their own thing. Like he was not, he's going to be on the Legends of Tomorrow. I know. On the CW seed, he just kind of has his own story where he's fighting demons. And in this one, it seems to be the same thing. He's saving a little girl. But I want them to pick up where the TV show left off because it was a cliffhanger and a mini deal from Lucifer was all there being a bad guy. I just mixed two shows. (laughs) (laughs) It's because they were both black. You just got fired from Guardians 3, Kelly. I sure did. I had that job for half a second. I came in with my impressive resume of movies that I've directed. (laughs) And I said, listen, Disney, (laughs) I have never tweeted inappropriate things. (laughs) Hire me. (laughs) This one is titled Constantine City of Demons, the movie. This will be rated R for violent, bloody gore and disturbing images, which we saw plenty of in the trailer, too. Mm Mm-hmm. 
even in the CWC cartoon, it was very graphic. So they, it makes sense that they're going to continue that along. And it's not like kids are, this isn't, that's right. not their market. It's, it's exactly. They're not there for kids. And then you put stuff in there and I, you could argue it makes a more compelling movie for the audience. The audience that really enjoys Constantine, this is what they're there for. You're mm-hmm. there for demon possessions and freaky devil shit. And it's great. Yeah, one thing that uh, when we were watching the TV show, it doesn't get as nuts as this, as the animated movie, right. where you're seeing like demons and zombies and creatures and ghosts. Do you think <laughs> they it's... had a budget? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, do you think it's too far a departure from the a little bit more grounded TV show? I don't think so, because again, I don't think the TV show is being watched by your average watcher, kind of like Lucifer was, because for whatever reason, Lucifer just fucking took off, mm-hmm. which was a great show. But Constantine's a little different than that because there was enough crazy shit in the TV show that it still had a very centralized audience. And so I think the audience is going to come over to this and you might lose a few people, but I really don't think you're going to lose that many because, again, it was a very centralized audience. I'm also hoping that this ends up on the DC Universe app and the same day that it releases that it also goes up on DC Mm -hmm. Universe. Wasn't there one Constantine TV show episode, like some lady with blood everywhere crawling on the ceiling or some bullshit? That was like the 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 very first first one. It was super fucking creepy. Yeah, you're not going to lose people, please. (laughs) (laughs) I do hope it goes up on the app, though. That is where we will be watching most, if not all, of our DC shows, Batman the Animated Series 24-7. Pretty much. Uh, (laughs) So I can't wait for this. I will watch it. I will probably be freaked out. Let's not watch it before bed. Good idea. Uh, you had brought up Lucifer, and I don't have it on the show notes, but you just reminded me. <laughs> uh, Fox did come out and gave the official response as to why they ended up canceling Lucifer. And they said it was because the audience was actually shrinking over each season. And it was a very expensive show to produce. Yeah. And they mm-hmm. didn't own it. Instead, it was Warner Brothers. Mm-hmm. So it was the reason that people were speculating of they were they rather invest in something that they 100% own and can profit from of course. instead of something that they're making for Warner Brothers. Listen, Netflix picked it up. Mm-hmm. That's all I need in my life. I continue to see Lucifer even if they just go on for five more seasons. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> two more seasons. I'll take two more seasons. Kind of a weird revelation that just popped up with Batman v Superman came out, you know, several years ago now. Well, Batman v Superman director Zack Snyder confirmed via Vero that the graffitied Robin suit in the Batcave, I don't know if you remember, mm-hmm. it was, it it was the on ha-ha's. the very first trailer. Yeah, the ha-ha's. joke's on you, Batman, uh-huh. and then the ha-ha's all over it. He confirmed that it actually belonged to Dick Grayson and hmm. not Jason Todd. I'm surprised that there wasn't some detective woman out there who like zoomed super in to see the butt, like there was a mirror back there and was like, "Mm, definitely Dick Grayson. (laughs) That's really interesting. Why did he confirm this? Was he just like typing one day and he's like, let me, let me confirm that. He confirms a lot on Vero. That's awesome. If anyone doesn't know, Vero is kind of like an Instagram mixed with Tumblr a little bit. And that's where he's on now. And I don't know if he, I'm sure he got, Vero paid several big names to exclusively post on there, and that's mainly what he's on. He does use Twitter every now and again, mm-hmm. but Vero is like his thing. And people are always asking questions because there's it's such a small user base compared to the rest of the social networks that you can pretty much ask Zack Snyder and there's anything and there's a good chance he'll answer that's it. That's awesome. So they sent him people people were discussing and tagging Zack Snyder in a conversation about the bat suit or the Robin suit. And someone brought up that's Jason Todd's though. Maybe we'll get Red Hood in the future. And uh someone straight up asked Zach, Hey, so it is, can you confirm that it was Jason Todd's Robin outfit and that you had plans for that? And he said, No, it was Richard's. And people, like, fucking lost their shit. Like, what do you mean it was Richard Grayson? (laughs) (laughs) And uh, I I haven't confirmed this, uh, but there was supposedly one of the... There was an on-set photo. Do you remember when Bruce is walking through the cemetery and he has the flowers in Wayne Manor Mm -hmm. in Batman v Superman? Mm -hmm. There's... uh, Someone took a set photo of the different gravestones. Like, they found the different names that are on there. Like, neat little references to the DC Universe. And one of them did say Richard Grayson. Mm -hmm. So people were saying, okay, so in this continuity, 
it isn't is he the jason todd instead of this like maybe he found jason todd to be unnecessary and instead wanted richard grayson to maybe be the red hood i have chills (laughs) i can't process this information right now you can't do that i thought it was going to be something like oh joker caught him and beat him up a little bit and then he's like i can't live under your shadow anymore batman and that's what caused it all that's what would have made more sense to me now again i I can't confirm that set photo again and and even then they can choose not Mm -hmm. to use it but that would make a great explanation as to, you know what, <laughs> I'm too scared of dying under you, so I'm going to go be Nightwing over here. What was Robin's dad's name? I'd have to look that up. I'm not sure. Because I know his mother was Mary. Okay. But I don't remember his dad's name. So could it potentially be his parents and not Richard Dick Grayson? Oh, I see. Like, in, in the tombstone yeah, instead? Yeah. It's like, possible, like yeah. Like, he, as a favor to Robin or whatever, he's like, let's put your smushed parents over here. <laughs> That was insensitive. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Disney. I, I still want to direct. <laughs> you got. You're fired from Guardians Four. <laughs> let Let me do some internet snooping, and and I will discover the Graysons. Sure. Uh, in the meantime, though, do you think it was it? They should have just done Jason Todd instead of Richard Grayson. Do you think they should have gone with the story that already exists? Do you know what Zack Snyder's plan is, Daniel? <laughs> Absolutely not. Okay then. <laughs> So uh, it was John, John okay. Grayson. Damn it. I thought I was on to something. We don't know his plan. Maybe there's a reason he chose Dick Grayson. If it is him, if that's what they go with. Obviously, we didn't see it in the movie. It's just mm. from a set photo. So it could have been a direction they were going and they now choose to go in a different one. We don't know. One of the other weird things is that the Nightwing movie now looks to not be happening. I know McKay, the director of the Lego, I think it was a Lego Batman movie or Lego movie, but he was attached to direct Nightwing. And he recently took all that stuff. He had like the big Nightwing symbol on mm-hmm. his Twitter header and, and everything. And since then has changed it completely and taken all that down. So people think that they probably, it's probably one of the many changes that WB has made after the, the many different firings from this, hmm. uh, from the DCEU. Or they dug up some Twitters <laughs> and he's just getting ahead of the game. I don't know. I think eventually we will see a Nightwing movie because he's such a popular character and he's something that adults enjoy, something that, you know, younger audiences can enjoy as well. Those rebellious teenagers, they fucking love him. Mm-hmm. So whether it's happening now or not, I think eventually we will see it. I don't, eventually the superhero movies will die off. Sure. Some year. It, it comes and goes. Right. And, yeah. Of course. It, everything comes in waves. That's not going to happen anytime soon. So whether you're seeing something now or not, eventually you're going to see, you know, we're definitely going to see a Nightwing movie. Over to the comic book side of things, DC's new age of DC Heroes title, Immortal Men, will be ending with September's issue number six. And I am not surprised. Most of these new age of DC heroes books haven't really been doing well. Terrifics is probably the best selling of the bunch. I haven't heard of either of these. So these are the ones with like sideways, where it was like the Spider-Man ripoff. There was damage, was the Hulk ripoff. Uh It was these characters that we knew like, okay, you know, this is if, if Marvel's not printing your traditional Incredible Hulk, DC is going to do it. Same with Spider-Man, same with... The uh, the silencer is like their Punisher. And instead, it looks like a lot of these titles haven't been doing too well. And that's another result of like people wanting original characters it's, it, and getting it, but not supporting it. Curse of Brimstone was another one in which is yeah. like their ghost writer, essentially. Wasn't he the one with like pff, like portals or some bullshit? No, that's Sideways. Oh. That's their Spidey. Uh, this is the one that was all in flames all the time, and he fights like an ice lady. <laughs> we ended up dropping most of these, so we're not helping the problem. <laughs> not but we're also not sitting there asking for original content we're just saying more batman more exactly. batman and you know what we buy all the batmans That's so true. there we go even the batmans we don't like like metal <laughs> Yep, that's right. A series writer, James Tynion IV, confirmed the cancellation via Twitter. So uh, we'll probably see a couple of different titles and for the new age of DC line. That's unfortunate for people who have been looking for new characters. We still pick up plenty of comic books. There's there's still a lot for us. And, of course, we always have more great things coming up. But that just goes back to, you know, telling everybody, if you're asking for original characters, make sure you vote with your dollar. Another confirmed ending is the Image Plus previews. Uh, that one is a supplemental type of highlight. It has the interviews. It has first looks at a lot of the series that are coming out. 
and they're free in the previews catalog when you buy the that giant catalog, which is pretty much like the comic book Christmas catalog every single month. And uh, last week's issue number 12 will be the final one. They've already been stuffing this previews with different like standalone mm -hmm. type of books because Marvel has their own catalog. DC now has their own catalog separate from the previews. And then Image was doing this supplemental like bonus thing in which they can dive a little bit deeper into the different comics that they're coming out with. I, for one, I'm glad that that's gone because there's enough for, for like different... That book is getting really thick as far as like the different material. If you want to throw it in the book as is, great. But having several several books that are separate and then having to stuff them in after the fact is it, it's getting obnoxious. <laughs> Was this really doing anything for anybody? I'm I'm going to guess not really because they're canceling it. Maybe the image readers were liking it. I know we get a couple of image books, but we never went through the image pluses. I've never been through a preview. So <laughs> that's not saying they're not great guys. They're great, but I'm busy with other things like caring for our child raising him mm -hmm. to be an outstanding citizen. <laughs> and that reminds me, the previous catalog did come out last Wednesday, so it is essentially every comic book, every t-shirt, every Funko Pop that your shop can order. And a lot of uh, the subscribers at the shop get that, and that's where they get a first look and, and are able to pre-order a lot of books that maybe their comic sh shop wouldn't normally get. So that's that's kind of like what you need to get. And it's only $3.99 for that giant catalog. And mm -hmm. that's how you can really pre-order a lot of books that are hard to find or hard to get. We may have talked about this before. Maybe not. Has there ever been any talks about making the previews catalog digital? So it, when you buy the previews catalog, you get a digital code. Oh. So you can redeem that and then get a digital version of it. Okay. And I believe you can buy it digitally as well. Okay. That's awesome. That's really smart. If not, I was going to bust into previews and be like, I'm working here now. <laughs> this is what we're going to do. If it were just digital, I'd be worried because a lot of readers that are going into comic shops prefer to read of their course. comics physically. So if there's something about going through a giant catalog and flipping through every page that, to me, I prefer over the mm. digital version. But Well, I was just thinking, like, if you made it digitally and then somehow connected it with your local comic shop, then as you're flipping through, you could just hit a button that says add to my sub, and then it would send it right to the comic shop, which would be really cool. Well, that's something that they are working on. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you remember, a few months ago, we covered the app for that previews was we're doing, <laughs> in which people can actually do exactly what you were saying and pre-order books from the, the mm -hmm. catalog that connects straight to their comic shop. And we were just kind of worried as to how it was going to be implemented because what's to stop someone from ordering times 100 copies of Zombie Tramp number 52 and then like the comic shop has to order that many and someone not coming through. I'm sure there's going to be some kind of system in place, of but course. that's the only I, thing that kind of worried if me. If previews was smart with that, they would allow comic shops to put a cutoff limit mm -hmm. on the amount of books that they can order. And then you could customize it per book. That's true. Ah, I'm so smart. Previous, hire me. <laughs> I'll send you my extensive resume of food and beverage work. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick, we also want to give you guys a correction on anatomy of a metahuman. We had that great interview with Eric Chang a few weeks back. And the actual uh, hardcover is going to be, it's not going to be the oversized one, like the variant covers. It's going to be 9 by 12. So just wanted to give that correction real quick because the, the uh, there was kind of a, we both misspoke when we were doing the interview. So standard size, but it, it does compact with a ton of pages mm -hmm. as uh, shown in uh, the previous catalog a few months back. And rounding out our news this week, we do have What's New on Netflix for August 2018. This is just the highlights. This is not the full list. You can go on Google and type in What's New Netflix August 2018 and find the full list in a multitude of places. Kicking things off, the not the quite the Dark Knight trilogy, but Batman Begins and the Dark Knight just went up on Netflix. Eee! So that is something that even... <laughs> someone tweeted out like it, it kind of got the movies back in in the twitter sphere or whatever mm -hmm. whatever you want to call that <laughs> the in twitter which, sphere is that what it's called i have no idea but it's it's not something related to a, a tree because <laughs> of birds that, that would that would make more sense but people are saying that no mcu movie has been greater than the dark knight or batman begins and even jimmy palmiotti came out and responded to it and he's like it's true I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yep. uh, that was that was also Edward Norton that sparked all of this because mm -hmm. he, as you guys know, he was the uh, played um, Hulk, uh, the Hulk. I forgot his name, the actual character. But oh, 
Banner. Bruce, Bruce Banner, Banner, exactly. He played Bruce Banner in that first Incredible Hulk movie, which tied into the rest of the MCU, but he never returned because he wanted more control over the character and the mm-hmm. stories. And he said, all right, you guys can recast me then and, and left. And now he came out this week and said that none of the movies in the Marvel Universe are greater than Nolan's Dark Knight. And people were like, what? And I actually saw most of the tweets and it's like, yeah, true. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. He's right. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people love those movies. Even when I talk to Marvel Sheep about superhero movies, they always refer to those as being great movies that, you know, the Nolan verse. And then they go, but, but we're just talking about the new things now. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> of, course. <laughs> of course, we're just talking about the new things. <laughs> of course. Also hitting Netflix, returning to Netflix is Kevin Smith's Clerks, mm-hmm. which is my favorite movie from Kevin. So if you haven't seen that one, definitely check it out. It's the thing that really kickstarted his whole a career to what he has now, which is a podcasting empire. Oh, yes, empire. He's the reason that we started our podcast. That's right. Yeah, we. I think it was episode 300 that we had mentioned that. But mm-hmm. yeah, in case you're newer to the show, he's constantly championing starting your own thing, like filming your movie, writing that script, starting your podcast. And after so many months of hearing it, we decided to finally do it over five years ago. And here we are now. <laughs> don't, don't go back and listen. You're fine here. Just, just start <laughs> That's here. Right here. Uh, also coming to Netflix, we have Voltron Legendary Defender Season 7. We still haven't finished Season 6. No, we really got to get on this. We've, <sighs> we've been catching up on Ramsey's new show. Oh, Ramsey. 24 like, hours to, to hell, hell and, and back, back or whatever the fuck. <laughs> 24 hours to hell's kitchen and back. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much kitchen nightmares, but we are suckers for Chef Ramsey shows. I think he just wanted a show where he could put on a fake beard. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> and pretend to be a Mississippi farmer. I do like that we the sh- seasons have been shorter for Voltron, and at mm-hmm. first we complained, but it, at that point we had been caught up, and now that we're behind, we're like, oh man, now it's too much. <laughs> oh, good, good. It's only, good. you know, we still have, what, two episodes of the last season? I think so. And then whatever all of this season is, it's, we'll get caught up eventually. We're trying to find more time around the baby to do things, mm-hmm. and it's it's slowly going. <laughs> And the final highlight for what's new on Netflix that we wanted to cover as it pertains to the show is uh, No Country for Old Men. That one we watched in theaters when it first came out. It was all over the Oscars. Uh, Do you remember this one? Remind me what happens in it. This is the one with uh, sugar. (laughs) Yes. The the air can pressure thing. I didn't see it in theaters. Okay. Maybe it was me and Roger. I don't remember. But yeah. Did you enjoy this one? I remember liking it. I would have to go back and watch it. It was a long ass time Mm -hmm. ago. That Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah, that we saw that movie. It was a long time ago. But I remember you loved this movie. You talked about it all the time. (laughs) It was really, really fucking good. If you haven't seen it, definitely check it out, Brokat Core. And that is all we have for what's new on Netflix for August. Again, just our highlights, just the things that we enjoy and that pertain to us. On to the Brokat block, which is how our week's been going. The Podcast Awards 2018 nomination period has ended, so we want to give a huge thanks to the Brocat Core for taking a moment and nominating us on their People's Choice Awards and also on their uh, Games, Games and, and Hobbies. Hobbies. So huge thanks again for taking that moment to vote for us, and we're we're waiting to hear back. It's They're going to actually have the full nomination slate announced on Saturday, August 11th. Okay. And that's when we'll know for sure if we got nominated for the second year in a row. But until then, we're just eagerly waiting and uh, and very grateful, again, that uh, that the Brocat Core came out in full swing. And hopefully we, we do nab that again. Mm-hmm, that would be great. And then we can talk in all our episodes and say the 2018 Best Podcast nominated <laughs> us. And hopefully we win. Ah, we'll that we'll would see. Be great. That'd be great. That would be the highlight of your life. Like more so than your son being placed into your arms. <laughs> <laughs> it would be pretty awesome. Uh, what else has been going on this week? I, I got the Harley Quinn Expressions pack. Yes. Which is straight out of Batman the Animated Series. They did one for the Joker. And essentially these figurines, they're the same ones that they've been releasing for the full line of animated series uh, toys, but in this one, they do like these deluxe editions because, again, it is aimed at an older buyer, and uh, we can, you know, more or less afford those more premium toys that we mm-hmm. couldn't when we were kids. So, this one in particular has Harley Quinn in her classic outfit, but she's unmasked, and then you can swap out her head with different expressions that you can put on her. And then it comes with the two hyenas on yes. top of that, which is fucking amazing. Amazing packaging. Mm. I love it. I think it's it's great. Like when it came in, it's it's pretty big. Like we also have the back cave the, straight from the animated series and it comes with Alfred. So anytime they do like these deluxe versions, like I'm I'm a sucker for like that awesome 
awesome like accessory packs mm-hmm. that they are have been releasing. Well, they have even more cool stuff in there. There's the Joker fish. Oh, that's it's right. Chilling over yeah. that. There's Batman's utility belt from one episode. So they yes they, from Mad Love. Right. They threw in enough things so that you know if you're a big Harley Quinn fan, if you really enjoy the animated series, you'll be able to look at this and pick out all those things. I'm sure the Joker pack is just the same. Mm-hmm. Of course, we like Harley. She's one of our favorite characters. From the show. So, yes, we're going to pick up Harley. Are you going to pick up the Joker one, too? No, that one I passed on. But uh, I, I did really, really like this Harley Quinn mm-hmm. one. I like that you said it came with a Joker fish uh, costume. Yep. <laughs> that Swimmy Joker and Penny and oh, so delish. <laughs> Love that episode. Mm-hmm. And many will be able to enjoy it very soon yes. when it comes on Blu-ray in October. Uh, anything else for the week? It's been a pretty average week. I'm almost done with my training at work, mm-hmm. which is, I mean, pretty cool. I guess. <laughs> um, Leo's still working on his sleep training, but he makes it through half the night in his own bed. He's stood up a couple of times without needing like yes, anything else. Yes, he's starting like... to balance. He's getting ready to walk. And when that happens, the dogs better watch out because he will be up on the couches and everywhere trying he's to get close. to them. It's AC's birthday today. That's right. Yes. Our, our little our little Chorky is 21 or three, for those of you <laughs> who don't know dog ages. Yeah, three years old, the mm-hmm. little doggy. We got her uh, a doggy like birthday cake type of thing and cookies. Mm-hmm, a cookie. And uh, got her different treats for that. And she shared it with the other family dog uh, on, from my parents, uh, which is Sally. So they all kind of had this little doggy birthday, birthday party celebration. Yep. <laughs> yep. She did. Uh, that's pretty much been it. It was a pretty, uh, I say, uneventful week. It was taking time with the family. You and I got to spend a lot of time together. And. Mm-hmm. Which doesn't happen often for those of you with children. Right. <laughs> you know, we we have two hours of childcare a week apart from work, and we spend it doing the podcast. So, you know, we just got to talk and spend time together and catch up on some TV mm-hmm. and play with little Leo, who's just the cutest little stinker ever. <laughs> he is. Really is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, overall, pretty good week, I think. And uh, that's that's definitely a good thing. Nothing too terrible, uh, at least this week happened. Yep. I was playing my Ikemen Sengoku. <laughs> Did I tell what you is, that? is that the dating sim game? Yes. <laughs> it's because you can't play that Nintendo <laughs> Switch one. I want to play that Nintendo Switch one so bad. This one popped up on my Facebook, and they're like, date a Japanese warlord. And I'm like, I. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like Fire Emblem. <laughs> Downloaded it. And and I'm, I go back in time somehow. I get struck by lightning and go back in time. And I woo... Nobunaga, <laughs> All right. the fucking warlord who just killed a million people, right? But the, they're fucking tricky with this game. So they want you to spend money on it. Like, you can play it for free, but they want you to spend money on it. So there's all together whatever 13 times 5 is. Okay. Parts. So over 50 parts. But you only get five tickets a day to read. So you can only read a small portion. And then you run into love challenges where to continue, you have to buy one of two things. So you can either buy this dress for real money or this dress for in game money. But it takes you three days to earn the in game money. Listen, this shit's been hard. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm almost done. He finally admitted that he loved me. And we're going to rule Japan together. (laughs) All right. I really want that Nintendo Switch game, though. Can, can we get a Nintendo Switch? Eventually. Can as I... soon as they fucking announce the 2.0. Oh, when's that going to happen? I have, as soon as we fucking buy the old system, because then they'll fucking announce the new one, and I'll okay. immediately regret it. I'll be patient, but I've already picked out which man that I'm I'm going to fall for in... What was it called again? Like Pub Encounter. There you go. It's rated M for mature. <laughs> so <laughs> Leo it is. not watch me play this. <laughs> But I, I've already I've already picked out the man. I'm ready to go. It's the one that's not too old, the one that's not too creepy. It's perfect. He's like a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's head into our Patreon shoutouts for the week. This week we have four fantastic shoutouts. The first one goes out to Alexander, whose Twitter handle is at Swordfish Show. You can also go to PurpleSwordfish.com. Yeah, that'll direct you straight to his YouTube channel. And he is on episode number five of the Dead Channel Duo podcast. So on average, most podcasts don't make it to episode four. They end up pod fading and, and that's mm-hmm. it. So for him, like he even mentioned that on episode four of like, we've we've beaten the odds. <laughs> <laughs> and now he's already, he just has episode five on the can as of Twitter. 
not too long ago. So it is essentially like a gaming and sports podcast. If you have a moment, it is on your podcatcher, whatever you're listening to this on. It's on YouTube, and on YouTube it has like the two cameras, so you can actually see the two hosts oh, cool. as they talk back and forth. Uh, so you can uh, check that out if you type in Dead, Ch- Dead Channel Duo, and it will pop up on, on your favorite podcatcher on iTunes and on Stitcher. Our next shout-out goes out to Lourdes and Katie. Katie is looking forward to Deathstroke number 36, in which Slade ends up in Arkham Asylum. I'm guessing Batman sends him there. Probably. Since they just started, or they just wrapped up this story of Deathstroke versus Batman, Mm -hmm. so where else is he going to fucking go? Is he insane? Would you consider him crazy? No, he just likes to murder people. But He's just a mercenary. (laughs) Arkham is supposed to be, like, the lockdown. You're not supposed to be able to get out of it, but people get out of it all the time. Mm -hmm. So, Batman, what you thinking? (laughs) It's going to be cool, though. They, the title of, of the book is going to... It's not going to change, but it has, like, the Arkham Deathstroke and Arkham underneath it. Oh, so cool. They're kind of continuing that trend of mm-hmm. just, like, Batman versus Deathstroke, in which it, it actually does work because they'll have the big part one on it. And I had a lot of readers jump in on that particular arc because it did look like a new number one. It looked like a mini series, So that kind of marketing does definitely work. It's awesome. Next shout-out goes out to Bobby, whose Twitter handle is at Cuban Slim. He has been enjoying going to Disney and exploring some of the new additions at Hollywood Studios, namely Toy Story Land. He also sent me, uh, there's like a new pub type of thing at Hollywood oh. Studios mm-hmm. that he said was really cool, so we'll have to check that out. Yeah. It's been several years, oh, I think, since been we've been to time. Hollywood Studios. Yeah, that's usually our least favorite park to visit. That and Animal Kingdom. But we still go to Animal Kingdom for like Everest. Yeah, exactly. Which is a lot of fun. And then the restaurant in there, what's it called? Tusker House. Tusker House. Oh, so good. So good. Yeah, we'll definitely have to check out Hollywood Studios. Uh, speaking of Disney, they're adding a lot of vegan options to their menus. I don't know if you've been seeing that. No, I didn't notice. So Magic Kingdom in the last month added a vegan burger at Pecos, mm-hmm. Pecos Bill over in Frontierland. They added a vegan bratwurst and sauerkraut at this little place called Friar's Nook. Mm-hmm. So they added something else in Magic Kingdom. I'm going to have to look it up. But it's... Interesting that they're, you know, adding so many things and getting this this different crowd of people because they understand that it's a big thing. And I assume veganism is on the rise, vegetarianism. Yeah, that's one of the things that every time we enjoy Epcot's food and wine, mm-hmm. where we can't find uh, in the past and even like now it's a little bit more difficult to find like that vegetarian option at these different stands. Right. Most of the time it ends up being a dessert, which is like, I don't want to just go around drink and then eating sweets like there should be more of that vegetarian option so that's good hopefully this means that the latest epcot food and wine festival has maybe some more vegetarian options it does and i looked at the menus this Uh, week great i I mean (laughs) they have some things typically or for the most part it's the africa cart and the india cart that has the biggest things but if you remember india was all vegetarian last year right that's and they're not this year oh that's yeah, yeah yeah and like they have of course, a bunch of beers and a bunch of wines and alcoholic drinks. But that that is something that frustrates me. Again, I'm sure it doesn't sell that much. So what are you going to put in there, your highest ticket items? Mm-hmm. Because food and wine is really where Epcot makes their money. So I, I get why they do it, but it is it is frustrating to us. But hopefully in the coming years, again, we'll continue to see it rise. I actually, going back to to the broquette block what's going on in my life i am using almond milk in my coffee now how is it it's not as good as regular milk (laughs) (laughs) i was gonna say why the switch because i've always knew that i needed to make the switch if you think about where our milk comes from how we get milk and now that i feel like a cow myself (laughs) i feel for the cows but really unless you're going to a local farm and buying your milk there you really shouldn't be drinking the milk from the store because of how it's produced, they bleach the milk because there's blood in the milk. Because I they, didn't know that. yeah. Oh, now you know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, because they overmilk the cows, and I, I don't know if you know. Now, now I'm really getting into it. Sorry, guys. Cows typically live twenty to thirty years. Okay. Milking cows only live five. Gotcha. Because of of all the stuff. So I've been trying to make a switch. I I work with a coworker now who's been vegan for about 2 years mm-hmm. and is able to give me good advice and it's always nice when you have somebody I guess close by who makes the same dietary switch mm-hmm. because it helps. You right. know, it's it's understanding and you can talk about things and it's not just like, "Oh, but meat is so good," you know, stuff like that. Which I don't fault anybody for eating meat or anything like that. You know, of course it's your personal choice. So, researching that and then we started watching Forks Over Knives again, that documentary. And through watching that cuz I watched it with mom and grandma, 
I was able to, because I had seen it before, but now to really understand the health benefits of it, because of course I'm just had a baby, I'm ready to lose weight, I'm ready to, you know, be healthy so I can live out my life <laughs> to the fullest, but understanding all of that. So, you know how for years they said that calcium is in cow's milk, right. and that's why you have to drink milk. Supposedly, yeah. Supposedly. Well, they've done studies that this country drinks the most cow's milk and has the highest level of osteoporosis still, which is what happens when you don't get enough calcium. Mm -hmm. And that's because calcium is bonded to phosphorus in milk, and we don't have enough acid in our stomach to separate it. So you can drink milk all you want, and you're never going to get the calcium out of it. I didn't fucking know that either. Yeah, so you need to get calcium. You get more calcium out of a cup of broccoli than you do a cup of milk. That makes sense, though. Like, broccoli is incredibly healthy. Oh, it's broccoli like a super is great. <laughs> I love broccoli. So, anyway, little things like that. So, I'm just trying to make small changes in my life. I don't think I'm going to be able to go cold turkey because I love sour cream and I love cheese. And, unfortunately, there's animal products in everything, everywhere. Like the makeup and everything they use yeah, and our shampoos. Exactly. At least animal testing. Too. Animal testing. So, it, it's very difficult to make the full change. But if I make small changes, then... 10 years from now. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, do do your bit. Do what you can. Like, some people, like, and again, it's not that we're we're not preaching out to anyone, right. but it's just this recounting what we've come across. Right. Is It's always like the argument of, like, well, you're not making a huge difference. It's like, I, that, oh, well, then you might as well stop and give up <laughs> then. Like, no, that's not the mentality. Just do your bit. Do your thing. Mm -hmm. and, and that's it. So, you're doing your bit. Yeah. And it's like the world with straws. They're banned in California now. Did you know that? Yeah, I think you straws had mentioned that to me. Gone. The final Patreon shout out goes <laughs> out to Neil on Twitter at nmats68. Neil also agrees that the Disney Fox merger is too big. Yeah, he was tweeting about it, retweeting a lot of like uh, anti merger uh, tweets as well during that official announcement when the two companies were officially approved for the the merger. So. Uh, Brookhead Core is smart, man. Like we got <laughs> we got some smart, smart listeners, mm -hmm. and Neil is one of many examples of that. So huge thanks to Bobby, Neil, Ludus, and Katie, and Alex for supporting us, supporting the podcast on patreon.com slash the reasons I'm broke. If you too would like your shout out every single month, head on over to patreon.com slash the reasons I'm broke. And for as little as one dollar a month, you will get your shout out. You will get the podcast earlier than than the Sunday release. And you will be contributing to future improvements for the podcast and the show. Right now, we are just $13 away from our next goal. What number is our next goal? I think it's uh, number goal number four. And that oh, is good. to actually give away, uh, do, do a monthly book giveaway. Because we've done a few in the past, mm -hmm. like sparingly. But getting to this goal, we can actually do like a trade paperback giveaway to our Patreon backers and do more of that with uh, Patreon. So that's going to be our next goal. And then I believe after that is to try to work towards getting uh, a Google Play app that is standalone for the podcast. That'd be awesome. When we get to goal number seven, Daniel will wear an I love Joss Whedon shirt. Apparently. Everywhere. <laughs> and when we get to goal number eight, I will talk about that fake video game <laughs> that's been floating around. With that out of the way, let's head into our comic book highlight for the week. As we said in the very beginning, this book is Justice League Dark Number 1. This is written by James Tanyan IV, with pencils by Alvaro Martinez Bueno, and colors by Brad Anderson. It's mentioned in the title, and it's very true. This book is dark. <laughs> <laughs> it is, though, but it's also very grounded by Wonder Woman. Mm -hmm. And I think she having her on the team, which normally she's not a part of the Justice League Dark, at least in the previous iterations of the New 52, uh, this one itself is, and there's spoilers for this first issue, just as a heads up, it spins right out of Justice League No Justice, in which she was that leader of the magic portion of that team-up book. And it makes sense that she would also be in the Justice League Dark, which is something that Dan DiDio also said, that they don't want to just start a new book because, like they have in the past, they want it to mean something or mm -hmm. to be because of something. And this is because of Justice League No Justice. So you, they mentioned that miniseries. I've had a lot of subs that are like, I want to read No Justice first before I get into Justice League Dark and even Justice League, which makes a lot of sense because there are references to it, but you don't need those first four issues to enjoy Justice League Dark. This is one Wonder Woman kind of getting that team together. Mm -hmm. And I believe the first one is Detective Chimp, who wasn't in the previous Justice League Dark series. So that was, I love Detective Chimp in this book. He was pretty cool. Like you mentioned, yes, there are 
references to No Justice. I didn't finish reading all of No Justice, not necessarily because I didn't want to. I just have to prioritize, of course, with The Little Man. It's amazing if I get the opportunity to read every single week. So I didn't need that background. I thought the book still stood very well on its own. Mm -hmm. And I felt the way they handled Wonder Woman was really great because she needs this team, but she's not busting in there and saying, you're going to be on my team right now. Mm -hmm. She's trying to justify herself so that she can come across as their leader and be followed by them, which is smart. That's the way that she should handle it. And we get to see all our favorites. You have fucking Metal Mask Mama. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, with the horns from oh, yeah, 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 Metal yeah. Mask Mama. Sure, sure. From, I got gotcha. From Batman the Animated Series. Yes. And fucking Boy with a Cat. Uh, uh, Clarion? Claritin, whatever his name <laughs> is. Yes. So you get to see them. Of course, you have Etrigan chilling out in there. Mm -hmm. You get to see my favorite of the magic users, Swamp Thing, just chilling like I'm here talking to trees. <laughs> is like, it really a Please. magic user or is it like a more biological thing? I, I, It's kind of magic. I like that he was in this book. He was, and he's done this in the past, but he's just got in conversations. If there's a little pot of plant in the room, Swamp Thing can just come out of it yeah. and he can hear you. And that's like one of the many, we've seen him do it a million times, mm -hmm. but in this one, like, I think it was Wonder Woman or Zatanna, Zatanna throws the pot of plant at him. Like, hey, quit fucking. <laughs> Did he, you see he absorbed the pot of plant? Too? <laughs> no. <laughs> he just absorbed it. He was like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we get to see Constantine in this, which I always imagine as TV show Constantine, so I don't hate him. <laughs> yeah, he showed up very briefly in mm -hmm. this. I was a little disappointed that the Zatanna outfit or the design is still like that New 52 design, yeah. which I'm not a fan of. I prefer the classic top hat and the fishnets as opposed to like the Hot Topic-y looking <laughs> Zatanna. And I don't know. We do see her with the top hat like very briefly at the very beginning, but it's still like that kind of weird design for mm -hmm. her. But that's just like it, it's a design. Who cares as long as the story is good? And I love that Man Bat himself is kind of like the... I guess like the beast in the X-Men in which he's there to study the science behind a lot of this magic, right. figure out why things are happening. And then he can uh, sort of control the man bat in a way. He has the human body, but then the man bat head, mm -hmm. but it's still the mind of, of Langstrom. Overall, I thought this was a really good first issue. It definitely got me hooked. It set up the team very well for being such a small, like, you know, I won't say it's shorter than any normal comic, but it felt like there was so much more content in this mm -hmm. without being wordy which is difficult to achieve so i really enjoyed it i'm excited to see where it goes and and with the next one with james tiny in the fourth too who has been doing he previously did detective comics on rebirth which was another team-up book one of the other reasons we're like yeah this is probably going to be solid because we did like detective comics and uh, batman eternal he previously worked on so with justice league dark it's not an exception it is solid if you like detective comics more recently then you will probably enjoy justice league dark a uh, final thing before we go into the interview i know you're not a huge fan of the magic portion of the dc mm -hmm. universe uh, so was that something you were kind of fighting as you were reading it not really because i understood going into it all right this is all magic and for me i don't mind it as much if it's just magic localized. So this is all magic. Mm -hmm. This is all magic in the DC universe. It's not Batman's out here fighting this thing. Superman's out here. Oh, and then here's magic too. That's when it kind of bothers me because I, I like them to be separate. But if they're separate. So, for example, the Constantine show, the Constantine movie, when we saw the Justice League Dark movie, I was fine with all of that because, again, it's in its own little world. Mm -hmm. And so I'm eh, it was okay. Yeah, we'll stay subbed on it and see how it goes. I really, really enjoyed that first issue. Uh, but with the comic book highlight completed, we did land another interview uh, with another creator from Alterna Comics. And that's what's coming up right now. Unfortunately, you weren't able to join on the interview. Had to be on Baby Watch. Uh, Baby one of the, Watch. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a very noble profession. <laughs> That it is, but we hope the Brokehead Core enjoys the interviews, which you guys definitely do. You guys love when there's an interview. I was just talking to Brian last night, and he was saying that he definitely enjoys all the different interviews that we've landed. And we've been very fortunate recently mm -hmm. as well to have so many strings of these uh, on on the Reasons I'm Broke podcast. So passing that on to all of our Brokehead Core members, and we hope you enjoy interview with Bernie Gonzalez from Midnight Mystery Number 1. This is where Kelly will sign off with the Core. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and all will be well. And welcome to our comic book highlight portion of the episode today. And with that, we got lucky again. We have another interview from Alterna Comics, another another addition to the world of Alterna. And this comes from 
Midnight Mystery number one, which is right now currently in your previews catalog. I know a lot of Brocat Core members get the previews catalog. I'm always championing it here on the podcast, obviously because I do work at a local comic shop, but also because it, it really informs readers on what the books they can get are and what's coming up, how they can pre-order it, and more importantly, making sure that all the shops are ordering what readers want. And uh, with the latest solicitation, one of the many uh, solicitations that Alterna has done, the latest, one of the latest ones this month in your current catalog right now is Midnight Mystery number one of four. So it's going to be a four-issue miniseries. The code, we're going to have it in the show notes, but it is AUG181488. And today we have the writer, the artist, the cover artist, Mr. Bernie Gonzalez. How are you, Bernie? I'm pretty good, Danny. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you so much for coming on and for reaching out to the Reasons I Broke podcast because this book itself, Midnight Mystery, is definitely, as I let you know in the email, something that that Palpa Kelly and I definitely devoured and uh, are going to enjoy the uh, full mini series as it releases throughout the uh, rest of next year and since it comes out bi-monthly is it going to is it will it wrap up at early next year it will start october then we'll get our christmas issue and then it'll wrap up uh in april of next year and hopefully with uh some support from uh, indie comic lovers uh we'll keep going after that uh alterna has been really happy with what i've gotten them so far so i think we can keep going uh, i hope people like it enough to want to see more stories yeah, let's go back to your origin story of being a writer and artist for comic books before we dive into Midnight Mystery. So the Brocat Core know exactly who Bernie is. What was your first exposure to comic books? And when did you say, this is something that I want to contribute to? Wow. All right. So origin stories. All right. So the pilot episode for Bernie Gonzalez. Here we go. <laughs> uh, so maybe this is probably about junior high. I had a friend who was a little older. He was probably like a junior or senior in high school, and he was really big into comic collecting. And at the time, this was right before the image boom. So right before the big 90s uh, indie revolution uh, where you had the you know young blood, wildcats, everything great coming out from image. And he introduced me to remember the Marvel Universe handbooks. Yes, <laughs> okay. we, we have tons of those at the shop. Yeah, those are terrific, and they they were a great exposure for me. And I and I got maybe you know volume eight or nine. I did not start with one, but I saw all of these characters that I had no clue existed. I mean, at the time, like any other kid, I knew who Spider Man was, who Batman was, who Wolverine was. But I'm like, who's Wonder Man? W what is this Avengers Mansion? And why do I find that the schematics for the Avengers Mansion is like amazing to look at? <laughs> so I just dug through all the Marvel Universe handbooks learned as much about these characters as I could, understood a bit more about the worlds of Spider-Man and the X-Men, and realized there was literally this entire universe of characters I had no clue about, let alone DC. And that really kind of drove me to comics. And, you know, I went through the the usual suspects, right? 7-Eleven uh, at the time, uh, Kmart or Venture or Zare, if you were in the Midwest area, uh, any place that had a comic, uh, newsstands. And then eventually realized through my friend that there were these stores, you know, very, very hard to find, but they were out there, uh, these comic shops that just sold comics. And once I went to my first one after that, uh, it, it's been a love affair ever since. Go ahead and give a name of the, I, I'm just curious, what is the name of the very first comic shop that you discovered of like, this is the world, they only sell comics here. What, what was that first one? It was One Stop Comics. Uh, it was just on the west side of Chicago. And it was awesome because on New Comic Book Day, they would stay open till about 10 p.m. So I would beg, borrow, and steal with my dad. Either I'll do the dishes, wash the car, whatever chore you want me to do. But dad, I know you're tired. It's eight o'clock. Will you run me on the other side of town just so that I can pick up these comics? And One Stop Comics, uh, the owner was Rick, and he has another shop now. He's terrific. But it was the consummate comic shop all the way to the top, filled to the brim with statues, figures, Marvel, DC, everything you could find. So it, it was overload for me. I mean, I came from, oh, wow, this is a 7-Eleven where you could find maybe an Archie Comics. At the time, they were releasing uh, 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 the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Archie Comics. You remember those? Yes, <laughs> the, the yeah. TMNT Adventures, right? 
Exactly. Yeah. And those were neat because I was a fan of the cartoon as well. After school, I'd come home and watch TMNT, you know, X-Men uh, cartoon, Batman, the animated series, all of those things. So to see those on the shelves at 7-Eleven was great. But then to see that times 100 at the comic shop, I mean, that that was amazing. Was that about the same time that you started kind of discovering or or figuring out that you wanted to be a writer and an artist? Or was this kind of like an early influencer in that field? It definitely pointed me in the right in that direction. I was always that kid in school who, who was known as being an artist. So when someone wanted to impress some girl with a cool picture of something, they would come over to me, give me a few bucks and, you know, I'd draw it for them. And of course, they'd sign it and maybe, you know, get the girl or whatever. <laughs> or, you know, in high school, someone needed a poster or needed a design for something. They'd come to me and ask for it. So I was always, you know, that guy. And then when I saw comics, uh, you know, at first, you know, I just took it in like anyone else. This is a cool story, interesting characters. And I remember at the time being really awestruck by how mature some of the storytelling was and that it was not the, um, you know, the Batman 66 style where it was, you know, more campy. This was definitely more mature storytelling with relationships and adults, you know, having adult issues. And I just thought, OK, this is great. You know, I'm a kid, but they're not talking down to me. I love I love everything that this is about. Um, and I could see that. I, I was starting to kind of pick it apart. You know, it wasn't as, you know, as uh, cool as that scene from A Beautiful Mind where you could start seeing all the graphics, you know, all the all the algebra equations and all the algorithms. Mm. Uh, but, you know, seeing a comic, I'm like, all right, someone drew this and someone wrote this. And you start realizing what an inker is and you piece it together. You realize someone had to color this and it wasn't with crayons <laughs> and someone had to put the word balloons. And it's like, oh, you know, I, I think I can do that. Definitely not all of them, but maybe one of them. And you just start realizing, huh, you know, like this isn't as impenetrable as you might think at first. And is that when you decided to, I mean, eventually at one point you were deconstructing this, these works, these comic books. I'm sure you were trying to emulate them at first just to try to, you know, build your own style out of these comic books and out of these cartoons and shows that you were watching. Uh, when did you actually dive into either writing or drawing your very first comic? That was probably in, in college when I finally had you know, some time away from my parents who couldn't yell at me and say, focus on homework and, you know, on getting good grades and stop putting together these stupid catch sketch pads that are just accumulating in the corner <laughs> of the room. You know, in college, I'm like, huh, so go to school today, go to class today, or uh, just stay in my dorm room and watch sci-fi channel all day. I think I'm going to watch sci-fi channel all day. And while I do that, I'm just going to sit here and draw and then eventually start you know, I think uh, as especially with someone who grew up in comics, you start wanting to tell a story. And, you know, I'm sure like any other artist, you know, I did my version of a Batman story, my version of a, a Spider-Man story. Spawn, of course, at the time that was big. Um, and then you start real seeing things like Batman, the animated series. And I'm like, huh, that feels like in maybe in simpler style. Uh, you know, I say that very much incorrectly, but uh, a simpler style to try to replicate. Oh, I'll try to draw Batman that way or Samurai Jack. So I started to tell some of the, those stories on my own, essentially kind of like fan fiction comics mm -hmm. and realize, oh, wait, well, I like Westerns. Well, what if I took the idea or the style for Samurai Jack or Batman, the animated series and made a, a Western out of it? Because Spaghetti Western very much, you know, in the Sergio Leone, uh, you know, Dollars Trilogy style. So I played around with that in college for a little bit. And the series, uh, you know, kind of petered off after you know, life got in the way and I had to get a job and, you know, you start realizing that you have to pay the bills. Mm. Uh, but then somewhere, probably a few years after I finished grad school, I started taking it really seriously again, met with a few guys who were unbelievable artists on their own. And at the time I said, you know what, guys, we can work together. Um, I can put together some stories. I was always a really big storyteller. Didn't understand how to script, how to put together something in uh, a format, let alone a comic book script format. I thought, well, I can work with these guys, kind of learn along the way. And at the same time, you know, when they when they're working on a character design, I can help. I can storyboard a page. And eventually, you know, like a lot of artists, they kind of want to do their own thing, just like I have. And you start realizing, oh, I want to tell my own story. And that's kind of how Midnight Mystery came to be. I wanted to I was being influenced by film noir, uh, you know, a lot of like Blade Runner, Dark City, just movies that had kind of a little bit more grit to them, a lot of black on the screen. And I thought, how do I replicate something like that? And then I go to the comic shop and I discover guys like Frank Miller. And I'm like, oh, somebody did that. That That's neat. Okay. So how do I do something like that? But 
in a story I want to tell. Yeah, going through Midnight Mystery, number one, is this around the same time when you were doing the the uh, your earlier Spaghetti Western era? Uh, you're, uh, clearly, there's some influence there for Darwin Cook, Bruce Timm, uh, Jack Kirby uh, in Midnight Mystery. As you're reading it, it could, it could almost be an episode of Batman the Animated Series, which... Like you got the red skies and it's beautiful and and it's got that that Bruce Tim style to it. Is that around the same time that you started really developing this style for Midnight Mystery? I'd probably say so. Batman, I, if I remember right, I think that was September of '92 when Batman the Animated Series came out, and I remember that because it was a Sunday. I popped in the VHS tape uh, and then recorded. I think it was Cat and the Claw Part. No, no. Cat Claw Part 1, and I think Monday, was on Leathery Wings. And I, I know you're laughing at this because I know, Danny, you're also a Batman animated series. Yes. So <laughs> I was going to say, like, like, the fact that you know the, the, the month and the year, like, that's already – I thought I was a huge Batman animated series fan, but it's like, no, I, I don't remember – I can't say that I remember the month that I started watching this because uh, I was at – for me, I was at a babysitter's place and it was on on fox kids at the time and that's sure, you know yeah. when i started discovering it but that's great that you can actually remember the cat and the claw and then on leather wings that's insane so yeah i'm sorry gone oh I, I mean that was uh that was it for me once i saw that i realized this this was this great marriage of this cool art deco design and i didn't know what art deco was at the time i was just like this is neat this reminds me of those old superman cartoons that i hated as a kid because they seemed lame and then I go back and watch the Fleischer cartoon series. And I'm like, so oh, good. my God, I was an idiot. These are amazing. <laughs> I did not know what I was <laughs> talking about at the time. And you realize that those were a big influence on Bruce Tim. And kind of like you were saying, I mean, uh, if you talk to any of my friends, I am very much a, uh, uh, I don't know, when I find something interesting, I dig into it. This is probably a terrible example, but I'll share it anyway. I discovered John Wu in probably like freshman year of college. And are you are you aware of John Woo? Yeah, yeah, the director, right? Yep, director. Yeah, Hard Boiled, The Killer, uh, his first Face American off. movie. Yeah, yeah, Face Off. That's right. Uh, uh, it's, it's a terribly great bad movie. Yeah, like that's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a so bad it's good movie. I could eat a peach for hours. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> of all the lines to remember, Danny, that's the one. Yeah, <laughs> that and pigeons. Remember that. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's Very right. important. <laughs> yeah. So so I discovered John Woo, but. As I see his movies, I start thinking, okay, this is neat. So who influenced him? And then I discover Sergio Leone and the Spaghetti Westerns. And I'm like, okay, this is neat. All right, who influenced him? And then I find Sam Peckinpah and realize, all right, he's made some great Westerns. All right, who influenced him? And then you just keep going further and further back and realize what these influences are. And then moving forward, you realize, oh, well, they're the guys that influenced the Wachowski brothers in The Matrix. And, of course, their stuff influences – Gendy Tartofsky and making Samurai Jack. So I've always been a big fan of when I discover something that I really, really love, I, I want to dig into the influences and find out what what made that thing so special. And Batman the Animated Series, hands down, was one of those, uh, just one of the big life changers in my, art, in my artistic uh, career to realize, okay, these guys were able to accomplish this. How did they do this? What informed them? And that's really what got me into like film noir and understanding contrast guys like I mentioned, Frank Miller, Alex Toth, uh, Mike Mignola. That was another big introduction for Batman, the animated series. So it was really around that time where I realized, okay, these guys are doing so much with such an economy of storytelling. I mean, if you watch Batman, the animated series, there's so much story that's told, mature storytelling that's told in 22 minutes. And I thought, I want to do that. that. That is so neat. I am not smart enough to tell a... A, an epic or, or do something like Chris Claremont did in the X-Men series. I, it's like, yeah, I, I'm not that guy. But if you want me to tell kind of an in, interesting Twilight Zoney Batman the Animated Series style, style story in like 22 pages, oh yeah, I can do that. Yeah, let's go into Midnight Mystery number one. So what kind of balance do you take with being a writer and an artist when you're crafting out these four issues? What kind of challenges do you run into as being both the the uh, the written storyteller and the visual? I'd say the, the biggest challenge is understanding that the when I wear the writer's hat, I want to do a lot more than the artist guy can do. Mm. So they're a lot of influences that I'm sure, you know, I wear on my sleeve, uh, Darwin Cook, Batman, the animated series and everything kind of we've talked about. Uh, but there are just some things that I'm just not good enough to draw. 
So when I think to myself, okay, uh, as a writer, it'd be cool to have a scene where the main character, uh, Detective uh, Ezekiel King, goes into this massive subway system and there's hundreds of people. As a writer, I may think that may be a really cool visual, but as the artist, I think, do I really want to draw 100 people and do the Google image search of period clothes for like late 40s into the 50s, let alone figure out what a subway car looked at that time? Yeah, you know what? I'm going to have them go down there at like one in the morning when there's only one guy in there. I think that's <laughs> what the artist wants to do. So that's usually probably just a give and take between those two things to realize what serves the story best and how can I do that economically? Because I'm very much a, I, I don't, I'm not, a, there was a Kevin Smith, one of those uh, Evening with Kevin Smith uh, documentary kind of, com- you know, stand up things he did. Mm-hmm. And he talked about uh, his first time meeting Tim Burton and he kind of made this cool hand gesture where he's like, you know, I'm an artist, but Tim Burton's like an artist artist, right? Um, I'm, I'm not that. I, I'd be the guy that just, all right, I didn't draw this page well. I'll do it next time. Like I, I'm very much a, an assembly line type artist where, you know, the writer in me says, all right, tell the best story possible. The artist is like, yeah, but like, don't take more than a page a day. Like <laughs> you, can't, you can't spend a whole week on drawing the best subway system. Someone's going to flip through this in a few minutes. Just move on. Yeah, and with Mi- with Midnight Mystery, as you know, we're going through that first issue. It does seem like it is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the story itself takes precedence over the actual art and the comic book. So not so much the image approach, but more, I, I guess, what I would say, the more modern, independent comic approach of of the artwork kind of serves the story. I'd I'd, I'd probably agree because I definitely subscribe to the Marlboro approach. I mean, I do typically have a post-it note with two or three story beats that guide me on what I want to do as far as the, the, the main story is concerned. You know, I want the detective to to do this first thing and then he will face the bad guy and then in the third one it'll get resolved. And if I have some broad strokes, I want the big face off to be in the subway. And I don't know why, but I want a big blimp in there. That'd be kind of neat. It's like, okay, that's the writer. And then I'll give that off to myself as the artist and I'll draw all 22 pages of that and really let myself kind of, you know, guide myself and say, okay, I think this blimp, this blimp scene isn't that necessary. So let's scrap that and let's just do the subway thing. And then usually as I do that, I'll write on the back of the page, the dialogue. So I, I'm not adhering to a straight script. You know, I'm just really saying, you know what, this is a cool line. It popped in my head. I'll write this on the back. And when I'm done with it, I'll kind of go back in that, again, that Stanley, Jack Kirby, Marvel approach and say, all right, you know, Jack Kirby, you draw the best comic. Me, Stanley, I'm going to try to write some great lines. So I try to do that with myself and say, all right, well, if this page is better artistically, then, you know, I'll, maybe I'll drop all the lines I was going to write, I was going to put in there and just put, you know, just be like, oh, look, it's a subway. Mm-hmm. Keep it simple. With issue number one coming out in October, is this... Uh, are all four issues in the can already, or is this something that's still in progress with on your side? As a matter of fact, uh, and since you're the first podcast that I'm talking to this about. Oh, nice. So, <laughs> this is good. a scoop of any sort. Um, I don't know that I'd consider this a scoop, but it, take it if you want. Oh, it's a scoop. Uh, okay, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, all 12 issues are done. The oh, first, wow. Uh, nice. The first season is completely done. I used to actually, um, some folks out there may have it. Uh, I would sell the first six issues. I sold them as PDFs on my website before signing on with Alterna. And uh, very recently, I took all of those self-published issues down uh, just to make way for Alterna and to you know make it a little less confusing. Uh, you know, So I hope people like it enough to go past the first arc. Uh, uh, but there is definitely a, a storytelling that hopefully as you kind of, you know, in the preview software issue one, a lot of the issues mix between the, I kind of take the the X Files idea to heart. There's some conspiracy episodes, and there are some Monster of the Week episodes. So I play around with that idea in a lot of the issues. So very much issues one and two, which are tied together, play around with Monster of the Week, and then there's the setup of the conspiracy. But then going going into issue three and four, the Monster of the Week is is kind of the theme with the conspiracy in the background. So you can come in. Just read it, hopefully enjoy it. But then you realize that there's this thing that's building. And I guess that's where the writer part kicks in, where I'm like, cool, I want to draw the subway, but I have to connect it to something because 
the efficient artist in me doesn't want to draw a bunch of stuff I'm never going to use. So yeah, 12 issues are done and they're all interconnected. There's this great, I think, you know, kind of like pacing that, that just continues to build. Uh, so after the first four issues, if people like it, uh, they won't have to wait around for me to draw it too much because they are, I, I little, no joke. I'm literally staring at issues six and seven over here, like on a table I have in my office. <laughs> and you, so. you can't, you can't tease us like that. Cause now when people get the issue in October, they're like, this is only number one. There's, there's 11 more of these things. <laughs> and at the moment, three more. <laughs> You don't have to search that far in my feed. I think if uh, if you go on my Twitter or Instagram, there is a picture where I have the covers for eight of the 12 issues. And then there's another stack of of papers there, um, a bunch of eight and a half by 11 that are the remaining like issues 9, 10, 11 and 12. So they're out there. I have the proof. I have the tapes. <laughs> Now, I'm really glad you decided to uh, sign up with Alterna because there is uh, Kelly and I are physical comic readers. Like I, we've tried the comicsology thing, we've tried the digital thing, and and just simply by the matter of the fact that we grew up with physical books and physical comics, uh, that's our preferred medium. So uh, with Alterna, especially with the newsprint, the comics and the colors and the inks all pop more against that that type of material, and especially with something like Midnight Mystery. Uh, fits perfectly with that alternate brand of bringing back newsprint. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree. And that was really the only reason why I decided to to kind of pitch. I was doing it again. I was self-publishing it, putting it on my website. I felt very confident in how I was doing it. And I thought, you know what, if two or three people read this, this is great. And, you know, I have a store set up. Everything's ready to go. Sell some original art here and there, hit up some cons. And then when Peter at Alterna introduced the Bring Back Newsprint initiative, I thought this is perfect as an idea in the comic industry itself. It's genius. I mean, if the biggest barrier in getting folks to buy comics is the price, mm -hmm. then let's get rid of that. Instead of four fifty or four ninety nine for a Spider Man comic, imagine if you had a bunch of uh, one a dollar fifty or even two dollar Spider Man comics out there. I'm sure there would be a new generation of kids that would say, yes, I understand Spider-Man. He's on my PJs. He's on he's on my folder at school. But to actually have them follow the story, I mean, that, that would be amazing. So I thought Peter's definitely on the cusp of something great here. And it just so happens to fit with, I hope, the, what people will understand is like the tone of a midnight mystery, that very much throwback retro pulp feel where hopefully it looks like a story that would have been published in the in the newsprint era in the 60s or the early 70s where somebody would roll the, the the comic put it in their back pocket and say hey i just picked up this copy of midnight mystery it's like oh yeah it fits for any newer brokehead core members that have not heard of alterna in the past midnight mystery number one is going to be 32 pages and it's going to be a buck fifty a dollar fifty cents and it is because as we mentioned earlier it's printed on that newsprint so the savings are passed on to the readers and to the comic shops so at a dollar fifty to try out the first issue and then it, it stays at that price the rest of the issues are not going to be three ninety nine two ninety nine or four ninety nine as you know marvel's pushing right now five ninety nine actually <laughs> and uh, midnight mystery is a buck fifty for issue number one again in your current previews catalog uh, we do dove a little bit into issue number one, but just to read the official solicitation, because this is what we do on the, on the podcast every time there's a new comic or a new issue that gets solicited straight out of previews and straight out of Diamond. Follow the strange adventures of Detective Zeke King as he goes from case to horrifying case. In this issue, that's issue number one, King's latest case goes from freaky to fatal when he's hired to find the lost son of a deceased horror host. The mystery begins in this new supernatural horror series. What else are we good. missing here? That's perfect. <laughs> no, that was a good read, Danny. That was good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to throw in as much uh, alliteration into into that description where my wife was laughing. She's like, freaky to fatal. That That's good. That's good. Go with that. Um, <laughs> I, I think if people like X-Files, Supernatural, I mean, uh, Twilight Zone, I mentioned before, Kolchak, The Night Stalker. I, I love that one, uh, watching it in reruns as a kid. Um, but if you like, I, I'd probably say the best way I can describe Midnight Mystery would be that it's a blue collar or grounded supernatural. So you're not going to have uh, a vampire in the series. You're not really going to see a werewolf. You're not going to see any any of kind of like those evergreen monsters in the series. It's always going to be Ezekiel King dealing with something 
And then there just happens to be this supernatural aspect to it. I, and the other part of the sh of, of the series, and, and this is where folks, you know, you're paying a dollar fifty for it, but I'm really packing it in with, I hope, some really interesting storytelling because the probably the biggest thing that the biggest theme would be the whole series is really about answering the question, uh, what if I'm wrong? And I think as I've gotten older uh, and I've gotten a little bit more experience in you know life as an artist, as a writer, you know, you start becoming more entrenched in your belief, right? I think mm -hmm. that's probably fair to say for anyone. Uh, you yes. know, you just see the thing the way you see things the way you want to see them. Um, I think it's fair to say, without going into any other details, that our culture right now is very tribalistic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we believe what we believe. Um, and I really thought about that as I was exploring where I wanted Midnight Mystery to go. And so that's really kind of the central core. Like, what if I'm wrong? And I thought the supernatural would be kind of an interesting way to explore that theme. So in the first kind of a, a little preview here, so like the first line of the series in issue one, uh, first panel is, what if ghosts were real? And I, you know, hopefully readers pick it up and they start to think about it and you start maybe creating a conflict uh, because you have to either support what you believe or you have to allow for the possibility that you could be wrong. So if you believe ghosts are real, it's just this domino effect. Okay, well, does it have to deal with a god or a devil? You know, uh, how would it affect so many other belief systems that we have if you just believe in this very simple thing that ghosts are real? And, you know, I, in the series, I try to play with a lot of those universal themes that we have, like, hey, I'm afraid of death. Maybe I'm more afraid of failure. You know, that whole idea of speaking in public space, uh, public places, like do people are people more afraid of that than dying. Right. So I try to bring that into into the series and kind of say, all right. So, you know, if the, here's this detective that we kind of we get the idea. Yeah. Detective does his thing. Um, but maybe a few years ago. I'd heard this TED talk and it brought up the idea of the soldier and the scout. And this is going to be boring for 30 seconds, but just follow me here. All right. You're good. Um, <laughs> so the idea of the soldier is, you know, someone who like defends a city or they defeat an enemy, they protect something, they're fighting for a cause. And then you have on the other side, a scout whose job is not to like attack or defend, but their job is to like understand and identify. Right. So that they're supposed to be curious, check out the terrain, check out the enemy, gather a bunch of info. And that really started solidifying who Ezekiel King was for me as a character. I'm like, he's the scout. He's the guy who's doing his thing. And he's seeing these supernatural paranormal occurrences happening. And he's basically gathering info. And um, this will be a little bit of a spoiler, but it'll be well worth the payoff if you follow the series he puts those thoughts and these kind of like case notes onto these tapes. And those tapes, if you read issue one, like you did, Daniel, mm -hmm. um, those tapes go somewhere. And that is kind of like this big thread that you follow uh, throughout the series. And you realize, okay, well, what's going on with those tapes? Because he's gathering all of this evidence. Uh, so what's going to happen with it? And it's hopefully going to challenge that question like, all right, well, what if we're wrong? What if ghosts are real or what if we're right? They're not real. Either way, let's kind of go down that road and see what happens. Yeah, the way I read it, it definitely plays to the inner detective and all of the readers. So obviously, if you're into Batman at all, which is 100% of all listeners listening to the podcast and even people that say, no, I don't like Batman. You like Batman. Don't deny it. Everyone does. <laughs> if you like Batman, this plays into that detective uh, within all of us and also the horror fan. If you grew up with Batman, the anime series, as you mentioned, Sven Gulli. Oh, uh, sure. Darwin Cook, which we've been sharing a lot of images of recently, one of one of the greatest comic book artists of all time. The Hands Midnight down. Mystery <laughs> is right up your alley, and and definitely like when I when I opened up this comic and and you sent it along to us, it was like this is this is amazing. This is exactly the kind of book that I think a lot of our listeners will be looking for, or are looking for at their local comic book shop. So I have to ask, what did the Emperor think about it? Emperor Palpa Kelly loves that it is essentially she she said that it's it is like i said earlier a an episode of batman the image series she could imagine <laughs> batman coming in at any point and and saving ezekiel <laughs> that's a, that's about as flattering as it can get because i remember i was hearing one of your episodes uh was this like two or three weeks ago and you were about as excited as i was um i just my wife would probably tell you no one would have been as excited as i was after the san diego announcement about the batman animated series Blu-ray announcement. Right. 
And I think you said like within an hour. And I was like, I think I might beat, I might've beaten Daniel by like a minute or two. Um, oh. <laughs> cause that, when that came up on the Warner store, I'm like, you know, it's, it's the, it's the, uh, fry from Futurama. Take my money, please. Like, like you guys got it. Like, uh, don't, you don't even have to tell me that it was $112. That's fine. It's like four ninety nine, Sweetie, you're going to see a charge on the credit card for four ninety nine. Believe me, it's, <laughs> it's just too bad. <laughs> it's Batman, the animated series. Everything is fair game. It's like, just give me a checkout button. <laughs> that's Absolutely. all we needed. Yes, that's right. Yeah. But, I mean, that, I mean, it seems from, you know, listening to you guys talk about it. I mean, that was a really big influence for you guys i mean that's like i think you've mentioned that's the beyond end all batman depiction for you yeah it is the greatest batman anything ever and i i I said last week like you know what it's the greatest superhero thing ever because it's already it's like the obvious thing right like batman of course he's my favorite superhero if you want to call him super but that is my favorite comic book character and then with batman the animated series being the greatest thing that kelly and i have enjoyed and had the privilege of living in this lifetime and actually you know, enjoying the full series and even the animated movies that spun out of it. And we still have Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill and, and Arlene Sorkin, although she, you know, it's been a little while since she's worked on Harley, but we can still enjoy all of this material and all of these works and the comics that are inspired by Batman, the animated series like Midnight Mystery. It is really a type of golden era. I hope so. I think there are a lot of artists out there. I would say that have, I mean, I think about, Black Science from Image. I think of artists like Eric Canetti, who does some amazing stuff out there. I mean, I think it's fair to say that a lot of those guys have that Bruce Tim influence. And and again, like the, you know, if you go down the tree, you'll find more maybe sophisticated influences. But I think, you know, I think it's in all of our artistic DNA that Batman the Animated Series has such a, a big footprint in, you know, what we do. And, you know, I think it's probably fair to say, I'm going to talk for you here, but when you hear Batman, you hear Kevin Conroy. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, just one of those voices that it, it's so iconic that it, it's going to be hard to beat anyone. Uh, it's going to, it's, it's hard. Even uh, I'm the guy from New Frontier uh, and he was on Law and Order and I can't remember his name right now. Yeah. I can't recall. Yeah. He did a fair job. And so does Bruce Greenwood in some of the newer animated, the new 52 series uh, movies. But I mean, it's just, it's Kevin Conroy. He set, he set the table so well that when you think about what he did, and we mentioned some of the great other voice actors, Andrea Romano and just the direction, it's, it's a high bar to have and to be able to, like you said, have grown up around that time and have that as a touch point. It's just like, oh yeah, that's, this is great. And you're going to give it to me now in high definition. It's like, sure, that's absolutely fine. I will happily do that. Make more. (laughs) Exactly right. (laughs) If you also fondly remember, if you're like, yeah, of course, Batman, if you agree with everything we just said about Batman, the animated series, Midnight Mystery is for you. It is in your previews catalog right now. It is in the independent section. I'll turn out along with uh, other great comic books in your previews catalog for this month that just released uh, this past week. So the order code, once again, like August, AUG 181488 releases on october 31st no delays or anything october 31st is the day correct it's on halloween it can't fit a newsprint scary story on halloween uh i don't know if i can make it any better yeah, what more can you ask for <laughs> and reading this issue especially like that is the perfect like th- that whole month is going to have a lot of uh, horror comics and 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 this kind of genre especially so this is the perfect month for midnight mystery you couldn't have asked for a better month to launch in and with number one for a buck fifty, 32 pages on that beautiful newsprint that Alterna Comics publishes and gives us, uh, where can listeners view some preview pages for Midnight Mystery number one? You can just visit my website. It's IWantMystery.com. Hopefully you'll want mystery. I know I want mystery. See what I did there? Uh, that mm-hmm. works. <laughs> and then on Twitter and Instagram, at IWantMystery. Try to keep it fairly simple. Facebook, sorry, it's at Midnight Mystery. Um, I also own I Want Mystery, but I have to put together those pages. But if you just remember I Want Mystery on the website, you'll find what you were talking about, Daniel, some trailers for some upcoming issues. You'll find a trailer for issue one. You'll find a 30-minute audio play. I'm a big fan of the old Shadow uh, old-time radio series, so I actually recorded a 30-minute audio play for uh, a midnight mystery story called the house that Satan built. So it's free. It's on there full, full effects and everything. 
um, so folks can get a sense for what Midnight Mystery is about. And yeah, there's also a shop with original art prints, a bunch of stuff on there. So you can check out any of those to keep uh, keep up to date on Midnight Mystery News. I want mystery. As always, there will be links in today's show notes. Just swipe on over to the show notes and you will find links to everywhere you can find IWantMystery.com and also Bernie, where you can follow him on Instagram, Twitter, and of course, Facebook. Let your comic shop know. They won't order it unless you let them know. Sometimes the, the comic shops will just order based on pre-orders. So you have the, the order code, but if anything, any competent comic shop should be able to say, you should be able to walk up to the counter and say, I want to pre-order, I want to subscribe to Midnight Mystery. It's in the latest previews catalog, and they should be able to add it right on your pull list for your subscription. So once again, Midnight Mystery number one. If you're into Batman, the animated series, Darwin Cook, Bruce Tim, Sven Gulli, Pretty, pretty much our childhood, <laughs> then you will want Midnight Mystery number one. Bernie, I've got to congratulate you again on this awesome comic and on this awesome miniseries and what is now that you that I learned on the show along with everyone else, 12 issues. We're going to get more of these than just these top four, hopefully, as long as everyone you know adds it on to their sub list. That's just great news. And I, I once again, I want to congratulate you on this beautiful piece of work. Awesome. Thanks, Danny. No, I appreciate it. I'm glad uh, you and Kelly enjoyed it. I hope the uh, Brokehead Core likes it. Um, yeah, and I've got more stories to tell. So just check out number one and we'll kind of go from there. Very, very good. Thank you so much, Bernie, for coming on the Reasons I'm Broke podcast and sharing with the rest of the Brokehead Core. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, guys. All right, Brokehead Core, as always, thank you so much for tuning in and all will be well. See you next week.